Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 41 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises on the Catholic Church of St. Nicholas in the Bronx, New York, in 1964. Father Brendan Flynn begins his sermon, speaking to us, the congregation. What do you do when you're not sure, he asks. The topic of his sermon is doubt. Doubt about your faith or doubt about yourself or others. Father Flynn is the pastor of the school attached to St. Nicholas, where his duties include teaching P.E. to the boys. The rest of the teaching staff are Catholic nuns, led by Sister Aloysius Bovier, a no-nonsense disciplinarian of the old school. Sister Aloysius has her own doubts, not about her faith or how the school should be run, but about Father Flynn's relationship with the boys, or in fact, with one boy, 12-year-old Donald Muller who has only recently arrived at St. Nicholas and happens to be the first and only black child in the school. Sister Aloysius is determined to air her doubts and pursues a sequence of inquiries that rocks the school community as well as her own certainties. This is John Patrick Shanley's disturbing and moving play, Doubt, which in the precise psychological orchestration of the relationships between its principal characters challenges us all to question our certainties. The play was first produced off-Broadway in New York in November 2004, before transferring to Broadway in March 2005. It won the Tony Award for Best Play, as well as the Pulitzer Prize for Drama that year, and was made into a film in 2008, written and directed by the play's author, and starring Meryl Streep, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, and Viola Davis. As we record this episode, Doubt is being revived at the Chichester Festival Theatre with Monica Dolan, Sam Spruill, Jessica Rhodes, and Rebecca Scroggs delivering stunning performances. John Patrick Shanley is himself originally from the Bronx and is the author of more than two dozen plays, as well as screenplays, including for Moonstruck, for which he won an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. I'm delighted to be joined today by one of this country's finest actors, Monica Dolan. In whatever medium she works, on stage, TV, and film, she never fails to deliver a deeply authentic and memorable characterization with precise intelligence and devastatingly lucid emotions. Just to highlight a few of her triumphs, she won an Olivier Award for Best Supporting Actress in the 2019 West End production of All About Eve, a BAFTA Award for her unforgettable performance as Rosemary West in Appropriate Adult on ITV in 2011, a BAFTA nomination for Best Supporting Actress in a Very English Scandal alongside Hugh Grant. She was hilarious in the BBC spoof W1A and delivered a beautiful, understated cameo in the recent Netflix film, The Dig, to name just a very, very few. She also wrote and starred in her own play, Beasts, which we were fortunate enough to be able to publish when I was at Samuel French. So I'm especially happy to be able to welcome Monica to the podcast. Hi, Monica. Great to see you. Hi, Douglas. It's really nice of you to invite me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for taking time during the run of doubt to talk to me about the play. Congratulations on the production. You are wonderful as ever. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it seems to be going well. And I'm glad that I got that introduction you gave me recorded because I'm going to listen to that when I'm feeling blue. It was so superlative. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. So my first question is, what attracted you to do this play and specifically, I suppose, the part of Sister Aloysius? Well, I just absolutely love the play. I think it's, it's brilliantly structured. I think that what's interesting about it as well, you can certainly sort of taste the well-made American play in it and the tradition of beautifully structured American plays. And yet within that, it's all about doubt. So I think the audience has the safety of, of that. You know, they feel as if they're in this tight, brilliant structural environment of the play, yet psychologically what it examines is to do with uncertainty and it's sort of really about who you are and what rocks you. I think I'm fascinated also by the 
dichotomy, the difference between your soul and your reputation. You know, Father Flint talks about his reputation a lot. And Sister Aloysius, everything that she talks about is who you are and, and you know, what you do yourself and your conscience. And um, I absolutely love the character of Sister Aloysius. She's one, one of the things that really is very intriguing and fascinating about it as well is that there are two very different approaches to children and to relating to children. I felt like I could really feel where she was coming from, that she was trying to create a safe space for children where the parameters are clear. She has a wonderful line where she says to Sister James, Sister James says, I want my children to feel they can talk to me. And I think that Sister Aloysius is genuinely bewildered and confused when she replies, they're children, they can talk to each other. Yeah. That really what she's trying to create is a safe space for children to get on with each other. I don't think she sort of holds necessarily with, well, any sort of intimacy between the adults and the children that, that you, get, you give them a safe space. So she might seem harder on the other adults in the play. And from Sister James's account, she's kind of ter all the children are terrified of her. But Sister James also says that the children are happy. I like to think that she's achieved a safe environment for, for the children. And obviously when Father Flynn's there, when he comes into the equation from Sister Aloysius's perspective, that's when the safety starts to possibly disintegrate or she feels it's not a safe environment anymore. And that's when she starts to do something. I think when people look at it and read it, they can think, oh, she's really horrible from the word go. But actually, when we meet her, you know, a lot of the time in rehearsal, people will say, well, I like Sister Aloysius, as if, you know, the, the presupposition was that she wasn't very nice. But when we meet her, I think it has to be remembered that she's just dealt with something that Sister James didn't really deal with properly. And that Sister James you know, a child ended up having to go home. And when the play starts, certainly, I think Sister Aloysius is sort of thinking, oh my goodness, your class is completely out of control. I'm gonna to have to deal with this teacher straight away. And also she's a young teacher dealing with the top class. They're 12 and their hormones are all going bonkers. And she'd usually have more experienced nuns dealing with those, you know, children of that age. Well, you're doing a pretty good job of defending her because uh, you're right. She's initially appears not very likable. And we'll come mm. to talk a bit more about her. She's a complex character. Very much so, yeah. But I, I think before we dive into that kind of detail, perhaps for um, the benefit of listeners who don't know the play, I wonder if we could give them a, a little bit of a summary of what happens and, and who these characters are. Well, it's set, it's, I suppose, quite a hot house sort of environment. That's what we've certainly experienced in rehearsal because it's set in St. Nicholas School, of which Sister Aloysius is the principal. Sister Aloysius is a, is a nun of the Order of the Sisters of Charity. One of the teachers is Father Flynn. And it's a very interesting power structure because nuns take a vow of poverty, chastity and obedience, as do the priests. And so it's very clearly set out who's answerable to who and what the uh, chain of discipline is. So yes, obedience runs very much through the play. And if Sister Aloysius suspected Father Flynn of interfering with one of the boys, Donald Muller, which she does, then she ought to report it to the Monsignor, who she's answerable to, and Father Flynn is answerable to. But she doesn't well, she calls him guileless and she doesn't think he'll take care of the situation. So she's, she actually does something extremely radical and finds a way to confront Father Flynn herself. And yes, it's, it's really all about how that unfolds. And I do think there's a moment where Sister Aloysius finds definitely who she really is really explodes out and what she's prepared to do to protect these children because, you know, she's taken this vow of obedience and she sort of realises that she doesn't want to be obedient to this structure if it facilitates this kind of behaviour. But also, um, 
Donald Muller, as you said, he's he's the first child of colour at the school. The civil rights movement was obviously very, very active at that time. And, you know, she talks very much about protecting Donald Muller. And if anyone hits him, then let me know straight away to Sister James, because Donald Muller's in her class. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. It's interesting that she takes the risk because, of course, she doesn't believe in, in the hierarchy of the church and being a female, that going through the usual lines of reporting is going to get anywhere, that you know the management, the senior management of the church, so to speak, will not credit her and will not back her and will not challenge the father and will not essentially not believe her. No, so. that's exactly right. And I think that um, that's a lot of what rocks her because you know she's given her life to the Catholic Church, so she really, it's, it's absolutely fundamental to her and she passionately believes in it and generally follows the structure of it. Yes. And is, like you say, a disciplinarian, and she follows the rules, and she's all about the rules. But in this scenario, she just can't, she just sees that the procedure isn't going to do any good. I was really struck earlier by what you said about the structure of the play, about it being a well-made play, and that, and I hadn't thought of that, that contrast between you feeling how tightly done it is, which you do, and of course, the subject being doubt. That's, that was a wonderful point. Your director, Leah Williams, has said the play is like a thriller. Mm. And it really felt like a tense kind of crime thriller or courtroom drama in a way, isn't it? Though, of course, yeah. there's no actual observed crime or real bloodshed. But did you feel that that way? Is that how you talked about presenting this as some kind of, albeit psychological thriller? Well, certainly you can feel in the... As the play goes on, you can feel it tightening up and tightening up and tightening up and the tension becoming more and more and more. Also, you know, it's always a, a sort of rocky time during the previews trying to get it from something that's pedestrian to something urgent. The play is very urgent, but we had to play that and raise the tension in the, in the stakes and in ourselves. I mean, there's obviously a tension is you, you literally don't know what's gone on, of course. No. But it also becomes, I think what was interesting about the structure is that it becomes very much a battle between the um, two lead personalities in particular, doesn't it? Sister Aloysius and the father. Yes, they're completely at loggerheads. Yeah, and it's a sort of classic form in a way of a thriller. If you think about that, the dogged prosecutor or detective or whoever, who is yes. trying to catch out an uh, apparently upright charming, clever adversary who may or may not be guilty. And she has very little proof or evidence to go on. She has her certainty. Yes. And she has her experience and she has her um, intuition and her faith. A book actually that came up a bit in rehearsal was Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, which is, you know, it's sort of all about intuition. And I think the first chapter of that talks about a fireman who's, who in, an, in a very extreme, dangerous situation, someone was about to open a door and he said, don't open that door. And he didn't really know why in that instant, but all of his experience in that moment came together in an instant of what we call intuition. And uh, yes, it would have been a very dangerous thing to open that door. Uh, well, yeah, you say this, and of course she has her certainty, and this is part of the point of the whole through line of the play. Yes. But we, I think part of the interesting things about the structure is that is that we are not sure about her instinct. We think she has no proof. What is she doing? And I think that's exacerbated or that, that kind of balance of that view may be partly to do with the way they contrast the characters as well. So what you talking earlier about Sister Aloysius, isn't it true to say that initially we're not really all that fond of her i don't know it's, i'm sorry douglas i have to say it's none of my business whether you're fond of her or not true or the audience is i don't think i'd do very well if i wondered or worried about whether the audience is fond of, of characters that i play so okay fair point <laughs> But what I meant was, do you not think that it's playing with the balance of our doubt, that she's presented this way, and therefore we're not necessarily aligned with her? No. Certainly in the first half of the play, because we don't necessarily know that her instincts are right. She seems a pretty closed-minded kind of character. She knows what's right, and that's it. She's quite mean to the young teacher, Sister James. 
some of her views about education. She talks about the art class being a waste of time. Yeah, she doesn't like self-expression very much. No. And that, that was all popping up in the 60s. So yeah, that wasn't really for her. So do you not think that that's somehow, that's deliberate and this is partly influencing the balance of it? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, if we were with one character all the way, I think it would be, you know, an episode of a detective series on television. The brilliant thing about the play is the artistic director, Daniel Evans, said that he's never actually heard the auditorium so quiet. And I think it's because the audience, if it isn't ambiguous, we failed. And I think that the audience, from the people that I've spoken to, they are constantly trying to pick up information. So they're listening out a lot. The whole point is that you come away and, you know, there are discussions about whether he did it or not. Actually, there was a, a married couple that came to see it on the opening night. And the moment the lights went, and then the lights came up at the end. He turned to her and said, paedophile. And she turned to him and said, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. <laughs> That's a success. You achieved the goal. Yes, it is. Because, you know, we're talking about something that isn't straightforward at all. And um, those sorts of conversations and confrontations that Father Flynn and Sister Aloysius are having are going on, I don't know how many times a day online or on Twitter those sort of suspicions and accusations and, you know, reputation has gone into another realm really with where we are now with the internet. It is fascinating the way that balance is maintained, how tightly he's established that balance and doubt in our minds. And as you say, I was really struck the other night at the theater by how rapt the audience was and how quiet. Yes, yes, they're picking up information. Absolutely, and listening, as you said. But I do think that it's based a lot on the contrast between the two types of characters, the personalities as well. So I, I will return to my point that we're not sure about Sister Aloysius' motives even. I mean, yes, you're saying she's obviously um, dedicated to her duty and the protection of the children. But there are moments where, for example, when she, after she has her first conversation with Father Flynn and Father Flynn seems to have come up with an explanation for this meeting with the young boy and Sister James says, oh yeah, that's great, I believe him. And she vows, no, I don't believe him, I'm gonna bring him down. Yes. And Sister James accuses her of just disliking him. And do we at that point, do you not think we're feeling, wait a minute, she's on a personal vendetta, she may be completely wrong. Maybe. I mean, you know, one thing that Leah brought up in the rehearsal a lot was how rocky everything is in terms of tradition at that time. Because you've got the civil rights movement, you've got the sexual revolution, Kennedy's been shot only the year before. In the time we're setting the play, I think that many, many aspects of society are changing. I mean, one, one area where I would say that I don't think that one can come down on Sister Aloysius as being completely closed to the future, is that she loves this transistor radio that she's confiscated from one of the students and is really interested in it and finds access to the news reports through that. So, I mean, Leah was certainly saying, well, all of this that's happening around her is rocking her. And also, goodness, I can't believe that I didn't mention it, We've had um, the Second Ecumenical Council of the, the church is completely altering the way it operates and it relates to people. It's becoming much more community orientated. So that's absolutely the crux of the play and central to the play as well. And, it, and a very valid reading of it would be that um, Sister Aloysius is rocked by everything that's going on around her and focuses it into bringing this priest down well, I think that's a really great point, though, about when it's set in 1964, because they do represent different views of the world and different ways of going about it, almost different eras. They do. And also, just to um, back up Sister Aloysius once more, what I find interesting about Father Flynn is that he seems to speak up for all of these new ways. But when it comes down to it, he turns around and says to her, you answer to us and you've taken a vow of obedience. So when it suits him, he will go back to the old hierarchy and hang on to that and quite happily oppress her 
and use the rules to do so. So he's certainly making use of the rules in his own way. He does that as well, doesn't he? When she says that she's phoned up his previous parish and spoken to a nun, and he says, but you're supposed to have spoken to the pastor. You shouldn't be speaking to anyone else. Exactly. I loved your um, reference to the transistor radio and stuff, because it also is her connection to the outside world as well. It's interesting, because I think you think of that community as being somehow enclosed and unaware of the outside world, because she is clinging to the old rules, to the established way of doing things. And I guess this is part of what 1964 is all about, the old and the new, isn't it? Well, she's, she, you know, she's the oldest person in the play as well. She has lived a life. Her husband's died in the war. And I think she's very interested in the news. She's very interested in what's, in what's going on all the time and probably makes judgments about it as, as we see her making judgments in the play. We don't see a lot of open-mindedness on her part about changes in the world, but that's the background, I guess, is what we're saying. And Shanley himself wrote in the preface to the published play, he talked about 1964. In 1964, the whole world seemed to be going through some kind of vast puberty. And I love the idea that the school, therefore, is sort of a microcosm of this world at large. Yeah, she probably thinks that the world's not going to graduate high school, doesn't she? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They've got it all wrong. And there's, you know, there's obviously a lot going on in that time about led by young people in terms of challenging the established social order and their personal aspirations and appetites, believe in freedom of expression, as we said earlier, that she doesn't really credit. No, I think she just doesn't see the point of self-expression, I think. I, I think, but also, I mean, she would have been born in well, with my backstory about 1902. I mean, she's been through the Great Depression. She's been through all of the prohibition and the world was extremely different through all of that time. And she's been through the war and everything. She had lived through so many extreme situations that rules are very important. And I think, you know, maybe in the 60s, it was a more comfortable time. People starting to forget about that. And they had the luxury of self-expression in a way that she doesn't really see. It certainly may be a luxury, you're right. And uh, I think that what's interesting is that the younger generation, so-called, of Sister James, the new young teacher, and Father Flynn, and their attitudes are more liberal, informal attitudes, I guess. But it's not that they succeed, that, that the new triumphs over the old in this play, for example. Sister James herself goes through quite a journey from being relatively positive, confident, happy. But maybe oblivious. Yes, but it's interesting that level of doubt that's introduced there with her relationship with Sister Aloysius. Yes. What, one thing that we found, uh, we discovered quite early on in rehearsal in scene two, when Sister James loves talking about history and Sister Aloysius accuses her of idealising Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And what I found very interesting about that and what came up in rehearsal about that was that for Sister James, Roosevelt's a story, but for Sister Aloysius, he is a president that she lived through. So their experience is, is very different. But as you say, Sister James is very rocked by Sister Aloysius's attitude and methods, I think. Yeah, we started talking earlier that Sister Aloysius believes that students, I guess, should in some way fear the teacher even to know that they can't get away with anything, that sort of disciplinarian approach. And she says to Sister James, she believes Sister James is too innocent, that she's giving the benefit of the doubt to all of the kids. But that sets up, doesn't it, this real debate and contrast about the approach to the children. As you said earlier, that Father Flynn and, and Sister James wants to be closer to the children, personally closer, and feel like a warmer personal relationship is more productive. Father Flynn says children need warmth, kindness, understanding, what does she give them? Rules. She's like a block of ice. But in the end, Sister James finds herself uncertain as to how to approach it. She starts to doubt how to go about relating to the children, doesn't she? She says at one point she doesn't know how to teach in a way anymore, whether she can do it. Oh, she says that to Father Flynn, yes. But like Father Flynn says at the beginning, we will go through times when we feel lost. And well, as, the, as Shanley says in the preface to the play, that those can be very useful times because um, it's when you're about to break through to something else. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you lose what happened before or, or that you can't draw on it anymore, but you've just got a, maybe a new knowledge or a new way of thinking. 
that wasn't comfortable to reach, but hopefully then you can use all of it. I think it's interesting about that attitude, though, to the children and that Father Flynn argues that they they need love, not disapproval and judgment and things. But they're all different ways of love. I wouldn't say that Sister Ella was just doesn't love the children. I mean, we all know, I mean, anyone who's ever been in love or loved anyone knows that we all do it differently. So I, I would say that I, I'd say that Sister Eloysius definitely cares for the children and she does that by making them know where they stand all the time. One of the things that struck me about the enclosed world as well, as you said earlier, that the nuns have taken a vow of chastity. So this, ironically, we have a situation at the core of this play, which is about sex in mm -hmm. some way. Yes. And I guess there's some doubt raised, isn't there, in a way, about the qualifications of the nuns to understand what's going on. The priest's taken a vow of chastity as well, so... Yes. But what I was saying was that they're trying to interpret things. And there's some lines in the play, aren't there, where they talk about, have they taught the girls the facts of life? And Sister James goes, I couldn't do that. We assume she has little experience. Yes. But yet Father Flynn assumes that he does have that experience when he's taken a vow of chastity as well. Yes. But I'm just saying about how you judge the instincts of the characters of the nuns who are trying to decipher what's going on. And Sister Ali Wishes is really fascinating, as you said earlier, where we discover, surprisingly, I, I would say, wouldn't you, that she has been married. Yes. Because you think she's not of that world and she has no understanding of that. And although she does at times say, you know, boys are a different breed, you're not sure how much she knows, but she does know more than Sister James. Well, she talks about puberty in her, one of the first things she says to Sister James. So she's obviously not got a problem with talking about sex or, or how it's affecting the, them at that age. She also says to Sister James, ordinarily I assign my most experienced sisters to eighth grade because that's when the children's hormones are starting to bounce around. But yes, you know, she's been married. We don't know whether she's got children or not. She very clearly says when one takes on the habit, one closes the door on secular things. So she's got all of that experience, but she's also saying that part of my life's over and this is what I do now. I wanted to talk to you about you were saying earlier about the about the judgment she's making about Father Flynn is based on instinct. And experience, yeah. And experience, yes, yeah, she says that as well. And I wondered about does the play not raise some questions about how we make judgments of other people? Certainly. You know, there's a whole debate about intolerance, isn't there? Yeah. And on what evidence I mean, this is the bottom line, on what evidence are we making these judgments? It's absolutely true. Um, and when Sister James says, I don't have any evidence, the immediate thing that Sister Aloysia says is we can't wait for that. And I think, I mean, we have a, an extremely difficult problem, which is ongoing, in that if there isn't any evidence, you still somehow have to protect the most vulnerable person in the situation. In, in this case, it's Donald Muller and um, he's a lot of disadvantages and he's a child he's 12. yeah but is the judgment based on and it goes back to again the doubt about this whole thing is the judgment based on her instinct experience is all very well but it could be prejudice and sister james says she just doesn't like him yeah that's true no you're absolutely right i mean the only the only thing that she says he he finally pushes her to say what is it what is it because you it's not just this thing with Donald Muller, it's not the altar wine, it's there's something that's made you not trust me, I want to know what it is. And she says, on the first day of the school year, I saw you touch William London's wrist and I saw him pull away. So it's that, I think sometimes we see something, don't we, that just stays with us at the back of our mind. It just lands with us and it doesn't go away. And then maybe other things come to meet it and everything falls into place. I remember working with an actress who lied about her age. She was pretending to be 15 and I think she was, I think she was actually 28. No, she was pretending to be 18. Suddenly, when, when she finally told me that she was really 28, so many things that had happened that I'd seen and didn't make sense fell into place. So did you have an instinct previously though, do you think? Well, in retrospect, I could see that I had because every, because suddenly everything made sense. You know, it's funny, it's, you know, we've, we tend to forget that we're animals and 
that actually if if something like that's going on you tend to give, maybe give that person a bit of a wide berth but yeah you know i mean I'm, i absolutely think that that interaction that she saw is the thing that did it yeah very telling moment wonderful wonderful subtle moment there's there's no actual you know there's nothing concrete in that that anyone could could rely on but she's very certain when she sees that and I mean, also to be fair to her, in the first scene, she says to Sister James to pay attention, but she also says, I must be careful not to create something by saying it. So she won't say anything. So in some ways, I do think that, I mean, I would think this because I'm playing her. I do think that the gossip speech that he aims at her, the gossip sermon that he aims at her, which, you know, is sort of a threat to her really, is rather unfair because she also says to Sister James, when Sister James comes to her and says about Donald Muller, she says that Father Flynn's been protecting him, whatever that means. There are so many words in it that are, that we've stopped and said, what does that actually mean? You know, <laughs> And, oh, it could mean this or it could mean that. That conversation, Sister Aloysius also says to Sister James, you have to be the nun that confronts him with me because we can't make this circle of confidence any wider. I can't talk to any of the other nuns. So so in a way, I do feel as if she's definitely trying to be discreet. I think Father Flynn's a bit more gossipy than her, actually. He seems to me to be spreading gossip about her or to try to influence Sister James in scene seven. But then I would think that, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> said earlier you're not well you don't care whether we like her but you seem to like her i do i do like i mean you know i've i've played characters that i don't like i think with this i can i think it's because i can see that so much of her sternness is coming from a, a beautiful place so going back to that point about her seeing that little moment where father flynn touches the wrist of another boy and he pulls back yeah interestingly in the film which i rewatched this week they don't leave it at that. They actually load the dice a little bit more because they have a scene where Sister James sees Father Flynn put Donald Mueller's T-shirt back into his locker. I thought, frankly, it didn't seem necessary to me to add mm. more to this. I thought that it was better when it's poised just on that small incident that she's observed. Yes, and it, and in, in the play, we only hear about that. I mean, a great gift that the play gives us is that we don't see the children at all. Yes. You know, so you're always listening out for information about the children as well as an audience. And interestingly, in the rehearsal, when we talked about the uh, incident, when I saw him touch William London's wrist, a couple of the other people were saying, it, it's so interesting what people put on things. So they said, oh, you know, when William London gets his wrist touched and he pulls away from fear, and I'm like, no, I didn't see that at all. What I imagined was that Father Flynn touched his wrist and he sort of said, get off me, you know, or not actually said it, but kind of pushed him off because I feel that quite early on, very cleverly, Shanley establishes the characters of the children through what's said by the nuns and, and the priest. And very early on, we learn that William London is a character who does not care about authority at all and his dad's a policeman so that's how i read and imagined the incident between father flynn and william london and i and i thought okay what sister aloysius maybe sees is that william london isn't going to go along with father flynn in the way that other children are and that that's what she sees because she knows william london very well Somebody else playing Sister Aloysius will have a completely different memory of how William London and Father Flynn interact, but, but that's what I see. You read a lot into that moment, don't you? And, and of course, Sister Aloysius has done, and that is what we take from it. Yes. This is a fascinating sort of take on it about position of the clergy. And again, this is to do with the, the divide between being inside the church and being out in the external world. And Sister Aloysius thinks that their role is to be the moral guardians of the children, at least, but that they set themselves apart as moral examples and that they are different from other people. And, of course, Father Flynn argues, I don't think we're so different. Yes. Of course, it's literally true. We are all only human. And I guess in all of that, isn't there the suggestion of what makes us human, which includes animal instincts that maybe propel Father Flynn and his behavior 
Well, we all have animal elements of our humanity, but particularly if you're a priest or a nun, what you're searching for is the other extreme, which is divinity. And I think that um, Sister Aloysius's argument in that situation with Father Flynn is that the problem is you can decide that you're somebody's friend, but if you're a priest and you've taken vows and they see you as an authority figure and somebody who represents God, then you can pretend till you're blue in the face that you're the same, but you're not. She says the, work, the working class people of this parish see us differently. So if you want to be their friend, I think her argument is, well, don't be a priest, go out and be their friend then. But the problem is, you're actually exploiting a situation where you can still have that authority and tell them what to do and that power, but you're pretending that they don't see you like that and they do see you like that. And I also think that, um, yes, we all have those aspects to our nature and, um, you know, they're exciting and, you know, thank goodness we do. At the same time, if that aspect of our nature takes over, or damages those more vulnerable, then that's a whole other area, isn't it? Partly I was intrigued by this because I just think it's a really subtle suggestion on the part of the playwright about the potential drives, impulses, Father Flynn may be subject to. I wanted to ask you about the scene when Sister Aloysius invites Donald's mother in. And so rather than, as we said earlier, rather than her reporting any of her doubts, she decides that she'll speak to Donald's mother and see whether that will reveal anything in Donald's behavior, because as you say, we don't see Donald. No. And I think this is the one of the most dramatic, moving, surprising scenes in the play. It's that adds layers of doubt, doesn't it, to the balance of things, to how we think about what's going on on the basis of her reaction. What happens is Sister Aloysius essentially says, I have doubts about the relationship between Father Flynn and your son, and I think that it may be improper. And Mrs. Muller, rather than going, that's an outrage, what are we doing about it? We need to do something about this. She actually pulls back from that and says, I don't want any part of your campaign against him. In fact, Father Flynn has been good to my son and reveals some background that Donald's father beats him. And he beats him probably because Donald Muller may be betraying signs or inclinations towards being homosexual himself. So this complicates his mother's feelings about how to react to this, because what she sees is someone who's helping to protect her son, who's come to this school, as we said earlier, the only black child, brand new school. He was bullied in his previous school. He has no friends. So someone is looking out for him and the male role model for him, his father is against him. Mm -hmm. So he's finding some sanctuary somewhere and the mother, rather than saying stop this actually accepts that i may even prefer that this continues that at least he's got someone who in the commons is being kind to him when the play starts we're in september by the time that scene takes place we're in october and in order to graduate and go to high school the whole class is going to graduate in june so i think what i read of it is that from a place of very great pain and resignation. Mrs. Muller is saying he's got to put up with this till June because we need him to get into high school and then he might go to college and I think he can go to college. Mrs. Muller has a very different experience of life, which means that she doesn't believe and, you know, probably <laughs> ends up actually being right that the Catholic Church can be challenged in that way. That's true. She says you're not going to go against no man in a robe and win. She basically knows that either Donald doesn't go to the school or this is what goes on until June. So that's what she feels. And I think that's what also devastates Sister Aloysius. But I think Mrs. Muller would just rather, really rather not know that this was going on at all. That's all very well to say. And I get it. And this is why it's such a, a painful scene, I think, is that that kind of reaction is extraordinary in a way, isn't it? That he would continue to accept that her son may be involved in this sort of relationship, but that she's doing it from a place of really profound need to support and protect and trying to encourage her son to find his identity as well, because she's almost suggesting as well that 
It may help him to find his identity. I don't agree with that, actually. No? Okay. I think that she's saying that he's... She's saying that he has tendencies towards homosexuality and that he needs a male role model. It's really difficult because, I mean, you know, we're so in our perspectives now. And basically to me, when I was rehearsing that scene, I was just looking and I was thinking, oh my God, this is like the mothers, you know, of, of the children that were with Michael Jackson. Because the priest's a celebrity in the community as well. There's a, a wonderful knotty bit around there where uh, Mrs. Muller says his father beat him for being what he is and it wasn't the altar wine. So immediately Sister Aloysius leaps on that and says, what are you telling me? Because she immediately Sister Aloysius therefore knows that something's gone on around this thing with the altar wine that Donald was beaten for. So she wants to know what's happened. Uh -huh, yes. But then in the next moment, Mrs. Muller says, I'm not talking about anything he's done. And then the next moment, Sister Aloysius says, I'm only interested in actions. I'm not interested. You cannot talk about a child's inclination. You know, you can't speculate on that. Her, her concern is to find out if this child has been abused. So she, she's listening out for Mrs. Muller to, to let things slip and to see what's gone on. But also, you know, from Sister Aloysius's point of view, and I'd hope from most people's point of view, Donald's 12 years old, and if a, if a grown man does something to him, that's statutory rape because he's a child. Yes, well, this is, the, this is why I think this scene is so extraordinary and, and complex, is that there is this emotional layer and pragmatic. It's both emotional and pragmatic. She's trying to get him through to graduate, as you said, for his future. But it's emotional, too, because her son is finding some kind of approbation, kindness. Actually, there's a line that did strike me where he says, my son needs some man to care about him and see him through to where he wants to go. Now, I don't know where that is. It may cloud the emotional landscape that we're all feeling about what is the truth. It's not black and white. I guess just more doubt, right? But the bottom line is you cannot justify sexual exploitation of a 12-year-old boy. There's so many ways the play is about doubt, isn't it? I mean, behind all the action of the play is the fact of religious faith and, uh, you know, that doubt forms an element of religious faith. Yes. I was fascinated by this because at one stage in my life, I read a lot of Graham Greene, T.S. Eliot, all that, and was intrigued by their approach to religious faith. And Graham Greene wrote once, a faith without doubt seems inhuman. There must be doubts about a mystery. And of course, you know, faith is, by definition, the paradoxical root of faith is, in a sense, we have to believe something in the absence of proof. Absolutely. So it's a leap of faith, as they say. Yes. So my question is, what do you think about Father Finn's faith? And then ultimately, we'll talk about Sister Aloysius' faith and doubts. But what is Father Flynn's faith here? Does he have doubt? Oh, God. The, the thing is, I would say that Sam, as Father Flynn, has a more difficult job than I do playing Sister Aloysius because he has to create an entire backstory or he has to create a way of playing him which, in order for the play to work, there can't be much evidence for. No. Whereas for me, right from the word go, it's very clear in the play what I'm trying to do and what I want. So to quote Sister James, I think I'd have to say, I suppose you'd have to ask him. I, I, I certainly feel like from his sermon at the beginning about doubt, that we all feel lost at times and that, that that can be a bond. I think that's a useful thing for people, definitely. I think Sister Eloysius, to her, that sermon would be very suspect because you have your faith and you believe in it and it's what holds you close to God and it's what holds you firm in your life. So although there are so many things in that sermon which are true and which are really wonderful and profound, I think that she would see it as, to say the least, something unhelpful and possibly blasphemous as well, I think. Yeah, you're, you're spot on there. That's really perceptive because I think she is actually puzzled, isn't she? 
She says in her first interview with Sister James, doesn't she? She raises the question, what was he talking about? Yes, and she does think it said it must say something about him. Yes, exactly. It means like, why did he say that? What do you think? What do you think of him? Yes. So she's using it as further information, isn't she, to compare to her what she's seen of that incident with William London? I think that he's godless. Yeah, and well, it's also difficult for us not to think that he's speaking personally in some way. That there's some element of doubt in him. Oh, right. So you get that as the audience, do you? Well, I, I just wonder, I mean, maybe I've looked too closely at it, but I think mostly you think something's coming from uh, that I've had doubts. Mm. And I think you're right about Sam having to play this because you see very little. He doesn't give that away in the way he delivers that sermon. You don't get, no, it's my doubt. He gives nothing away until there's a line where towards the end where he says there are things I can't say. Yes. Even if you can't imagine the explanation, sister, remember there are circumstances beyond your knowledge. What can't he say? And how does he live with this? There's an epigraph in the published text of the play that I read, The Bad Sleep Well. It's a title of a Kurosawa film, apparently, The Bad Sleep Well, implying, I guess, that if he's truly bad. He doesn't have any guilt. And of course, Sister Aloysius says that she has no sympathy for him. Because she says, I know you are invulnerable to true regret. Yes. Well, is he? There's more doubt. Is he a bad person that sleeps well or has he doubts? Well, he certainly talks about doubts, whether he has them or not. But, you know, she, she would see that as a bad thing. There's another line where he talks about, he says, imagine how it must have been in the frontier days when a man in his buckskins, you know, when he's talking about the wind and being at the mercy of the elements and... She just says, I suppose, if if one lacked faith in God's protection, I suppose it would be frightening. So she has not got the doubts. I think she thinks that the doubts are, um, are wrong. They're something that you shouldn't have. You should have faith. Okay, so this brings us to the ending. And spoilers alert, obviously. But the twist in the thriller is, is that she admits that when she tells Father Flynn that she's called his previous parish and spoken about his previous behaviours, she admits at the end that she never made this call. Yeah, that she was lying. She just tried it on and his response proved to her that he had something to hide as far as she was concerned. But the final words of the play, and I have doubts about the final words of the play, and I want to ask you about this, Monica. Oh, good. That's good. Okay. I have doubts about the ending because in the ending of the play, Sister Aloysius breaks down and confesses that she has doubts. I have such doubts. Now, we have seen nothing but her certainties through the play. Yes. And as you said, you've just said that she wouldn't credit that in your faith in God, you should have doubts. So what are her doubts? What are her doubts? So her doubts in the final scene, she's given her entire life to the church. She has got Father Flynn to resign. And as far as she's concerned, the fact that he has resigned proves that she was right and that there were things going on in his previous parish and that he has been interfering with children and that he'll go after another child and another. And then after he resigned, she went to, she calls him our good Monsignor Benedict. So Sister Aloysius has gone to the Monsignor. She's told him exactly what she thinks Father Flynn is and why he resigned. And the Monsignor doesn't believe her. And then the bishop gives him a promotion. And he's now not only in charge of a different parish, St. Jerome, he's also in charge of the school. So he will have absolute free reign to do anything. And the hierarchy of the church has facilitated that. And I think that breaks her heart because she has done everything she possibly can and more to protect the children in her school. But the church is facilitating the abuse of children. So her, her doubt is in the church not in her faith or her actions? I think it is in her faith because I also really believe, I mean, we tend to think, oh, she's very worldly and maybe even cynical, but I absolutely believe that she thought all the way through, otherwise she wouldn't try, that she, she protects these children in order to serve God. And I think she believes that God somehow will help her or be on her side all the way through. So for the church to be doing this, and don't forget, she's taken a vow to the church of poverty, chastity and obedience. She's given her life to the church and for the church to be facilitating the abuse of children, which is the thing that she, with her 
whole being. I mean, she's just told Father Flynn in the previous scene, I'll step outside the church if that's what needs to be done in order to protect children. For the church to be facilitating that as an institution and for God, I think she's wondering where God was in all this as well. Yes, I'm wondering, so does she feel let down by God that the justice she expects has not happened? I think she thought that, that God would be helping her. And I think that um, if you've given your life to, you know, an institution that God is supposed to be working through, I mean, the reason that they have this vow of obedience is because the person above you represents God. And um, certainly with the journey of our rehearsal, I'm the only person, I think, in, in our rehearsal who was brought up a Catholic. So uh, I was fairly clear on what that doubt was and and where it came from. I absolutely leave it to the audience to think what her doubt is. It's, it's not for me to say. I've had people come up to me and say, oh, so she has doubts at the end, so she didn't. So does she not think he really did it at the end? And I'm like, yeah, she completely thinks. She knows that he did it at the end. Her doubts are about everything else. I mean, Leah wanted to call it an existential crisis, and that would be a valid way for someone to look at it as well. I suppose I would say that for a nun, what else is there? You know, there's your faith and that is your existential crisis if that isn't there anymore. You're right that I don't think she has any doubt that he is he's done wrong. But did she have any doubt about the way she's gone about it in pursuit of wrongdoing one steps away from God? Of course, there's a price. She's had to lie. But I, again, I felt that may not be enough. I like your suggestion. I like your suggestion of has she gone about it the right way? You know, maybe... Maybe she feels that she stepped too far away from God, and maybe she now feels disconnected from him. I mean, it's very straightforward that she would feel a lack of faith in the church itself by what's occurred. Yeah, I think so. I think it's really, it's very easy for us now. So much come out in the news. It's very easy for us now to look at the church and to see that there are aspects to it which are, well, I don't know what to say, you know, which are, are appalling. But at that time, she would be believing in that very strongly and have no none of the hindsight or cynicism about it or knowledge about it that we have. The play is, as we said, generates so many doubts. And one wonderful your story about the, the couple who had completely different views, because in the end, we are left with our doubts too, right? Yes. As to what actually happened, is he guilty or not? And you can take away it as you choose. And But it also could be about the doubt we have about how we make judgments of people, as we said earlier. What moral certainties are there? Where did they come from? And I, I was interested, the play is called Doubt a Parable. And I looked up the meaning of parable, just to be clear. A short allegorical story designed to illustrate or teach some truth, religious principle, or moral lesson. And I wondered what you thought is the play intending to teach us something? And if so, what? And why do this play now? Is it what makes it a lesson for today? I think the play is certainly trying to open up something. I think it's relevant to today in that there's a lot coming out about what people have done and how they've behaved badly and uh, how other people have had to survive that. And there's much discussion still about people's reputations. You're saying all that very carefully. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's very relevant. I would say if you think about your conscience and your soul and rather than your reputation, then hopefully that's a better thing. I was interested also, there's another angle I think about doubt where Shanley in the preface says, we are living in a courtroom culture, living in a culture of extreme advocacy, of confrontation, of judgment and a verdict. Where are we, we are just so certain about our views. You know, the main forum for expressing one's views is 146 characters in a Twitter feed. So um, that doesn't really open up much scope for intelligent and heartfelt debate, does it? You know, there are many things that have been on Twitter that I just think, well, OK, I'll go out for a drink with you and we can spend the evening talking about this, but I'm not going to reply in, in a succinct way because some the matter isn't succinct. No, exactly. It doesn't leave much room for doubt, does it? No, and there seems to be this sort of competition to be certain as well, because you can come out with the best quips. Certainty always sounds good. Doubt doesn't sound very um, witty or eloquent. 
No, I, th I think he might even have said somewhere, not knowing something is, seems to be a sign of weakness. Well, Socrates said, wisest is she who knows she does not know. <laughs> I think that's a really good place to stop, actually. We can just confess, we don't know either. Monica, thank you so much. I've got a couple of things before I let you go. The first thing is um, one of the traditions of the podcast is I like to ask my guests to recommend a play that we might talk about in a future episode or even just a personal favorite. And I know this is hard for someone in your position who's done hundreds of them as well. This is very naughty of me because I was in it and I loved it. That's allowed. That's allowed. But there's, it's so rich in terms of discussion. I would suggest appropriate by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, which I was in at the Don Mar. There's so much to talk about there. Oh, honestly, I mean, if you, you're listening to me just now and saying that I sound careful, I think you'll have a very careful discussion with whoever you speak to that about. Oh, well, I, I might have to ask you about it then. I know you can do it. Do the careful. Oh, gosh. Okay. Another one that I've seen which uh, sprang to mind, I actually auditioned for it, is Clybourne Park. I think that's a very, very rich play for debate and it's all about territory and yeah, I think that'd be a very interesting one. Two great suggestions. I don't know why you have to audition at all, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Monica, for uh, joining me today. It's been lovely to talk to you and to see you again. Yeah, lovely to see you. As the curtain falls, the two Catholic sisters are plagued by new, unexpected uncertainties their faith shaken by the moral ambiguities of human behavior and the world they live in. One of the epigraphs that preface the printed play reads, in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increaseth sorrow. The more we know about life, the more we see that nothing is black and white, that life is messy, that we are weak, that there are no foolproof rules of behavior or divine guarantees. Life is an organic experience where our certainty and confidence are ever-changing, and although we may long for certainty, unquestioning conviction is dangerous. As John Patrick Shanley says in his preface, doubt is an opportunity. Ultimately, it is better to be open-minded, to question, to listen, to consider other testimony and perspective, to be willing to change. And the beginning of change is doubt. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at The Play Pod. You're also welcome to email plays at theplaypodcast.com to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes. You can also register your suggestion on the website. Thanks again, and see you next time.